Welcome to Revive Ministry Podcast. This month, we are talking about our connections. Revive Ministry Podcast would like to reflect on those communities we belong to and the connections surrounding them. Today, um, we're going to dive a little deeper with a new guest. His name is Patrick Ellers. Is that correct? No, it's Eilers. Eilers. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your insight. Just be, con- be part of the discussion. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I just want to share a disclaimer for those who are in the States. Um, 988 is a suicide crisis lifeline. But wherever you are in the world, I always try to encourage to find what resources are available working in the mental health field. That could look different for everyone. It could just be a um, a faith group. It could be just a support group. It could be just a bunch of friends, family, wherever that is, I do want to encourage those who are watching listening if you're in a group that actually you can ask the question i need help that's a group you need to be around uh, especially as adults it can be harder to do that um i like to say i like to start off with a quote because i know people say it better than me millet fueler says it this way for a community to be whole and healthy it must be based on people's love and concern for each other what comes to mind when you hear this quote patrick yeah, I thought quite a bit about this quote, and uh, I really think it speaks directly to a correlation between a whole and healthy person and uh, one's ability to love and be concerned for other people. And we kind of live right now in a society that's very, at least in the United States, and we live in a very self-centered society. Yeah. And so we really worry about our own experiences, our own comfort, you know, kind of getting attention. You see that with social media, you know, there's a lot of just kind of about me and fo- you know, inwardly focused. And there's really a lack of being others centered kind of in the, within the sort of society and definitely within like the big C church, so to speak. So we've kind of grown accustomed to our safety and it seems like we have a lot of safety that we try to provide, uh, you know, whether it be virtually, you know, getting away from people, so that, so to speak, or even just sort of just not allowing people to see the true image of ourselves, uh, whether it be through vulnerability or just other areas of our lives. So there certainly seems to be a lack of being, uh, but definitely, and the, the quote really seems to speak to the idea of having a correlation between a whole person and a healthy person and you know, the concern for other people. Yeah, you know, a lot of times, you know, the emphasis becomes of uh, do we look like we're doing well versus are we actually doing well? Um, and I do like what you said. There's this emphasis of not out being outward centered, but a lot of times with, with connections, they impact us in ways we don't really expect. So if we're not taking care of our connections, whether it's our family or friends, sometimes we, we try to blind ourselves with the idea of creating some level, like boxing our lives to some level of certainty, but we can never really fill that box of certainty all the time. It can be yeah. frustrating and, you know, sometimes it, it can be this feel that we just never have time for anything. And that's another thing that I've noticed, especially with connecting Connected has appeared to be harder, increasingly harder as the pace of life speeds up. Uh, I don't have time. Like I, I ask you, Patrick, how are you doing? A lot of times, the the answer is, "Oh, I'm busy." Oh, I'm busy. It's no longer like I'm okay. I'm doing fine now. It's just I'm busy. Some may say, you know, "So what? 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 What's your thoughts on the idea of how the pace of life continues to increase? We never have more enough time to connect." What, what comes to mind when you think of these kind of trends when it comes to um, connecting with others? Yeah, I think for those of us who think we don't have time, it's because we you know, we really do have the time. It's just because we're not other-centered, kind of like we were talking about. You know, it's hard mm-hmm. to – it's hard, it just seems to speed up more and more. We make it kind of more about us <laughs> and being focused on what our goals are going to be and, you know, kind of what our – you know, if you have kids, what kind of what they're, what they're doing, what their activities and those kind of things are. It doesn't seem like we make the time because it doesn't feel organic. And so what I mean by organic is that it's kind of not an autopilot response. A lot of times I, I hear a lot from people, one of the people I work with, you know, they talk about this idea that they want to kind of flip the switch and just be organic. And organic really doesn't work when you have to have intention. And so a lot of times when we talk about things being too busy is that we have to have intention to slow down. And intention's hard. Intention takes work. Uh, it, it's, we can't expect something to be organic, um, you know, that we're not putting attention to. Because when we do that, then we tend to backslide. So, you know, connection really takes intention. I think that's a big part of the reason why things just seem to go faster and faster. Yeah, and I, I do like, like you mentioning organic, especially if we look back not that long ago when we think about the civil rights movement. That was not done organically. 
Absolutely. That was intentionally. Um, a lot of the the, the pro people who propose the, the proponent and the people at the time knew this fact that we you know the cross culture it's hard to start something that traditionally we didn't take any time on you know the idea of how we treat other people how we connect with other people um and you know there's a lot of different reasons we could say well we love it to be organic but honestly you know i'm half puerto rican half south korean it's never going to be organic if i'm going to try to connect with others in, in, in that kind of space so it, i think i'd love that you mentioned the idea that we kind of lie to ourselves that oh yeah well just or it'll just organically work and it doesn't usually work it doesn't work that way especially when it comes to connections what would you say to someone um maybe listening or that says i don't have enough time to connect well what would you say to them um if you if they said that to you a friend or a family member yeah i think i'd, I'd have to really look at what their priority is you know kind of where are they at as far as what is what does it mean for you know where do you really want your uh connections to thrive you know if you if you are a very isolated person you're going to run into a lot more chances to be uh struggling with things that are of our nature things of the world you know we're in it we're in a um we're in uh, a demonic uh, war, you know, where that's mm. that's the whole thing. You know, the you know it talks about in the Bible, the idea of you know, make sure you put the army of Christ on every day. Yeah, and part of that comes from the fact that like people who are isolated for outside of connections, they definitely are more vulnerable in that way. I also think you know what it, what are our presence? You know, what, who are the people we have around us? You know, are the people that we have going to be people of high quality? Are those people going to be people who are going to build us up, or are those people who are going to make us you know stay neutral or build or you know sort of you know, help us backslide in that way. And there are a lot about what are people that we're spending the time with, you know, that are going to depend on how connected we are going to be with people as far as that, you know, the quality of that. So you may have, you know, 45 people, 30, you know, 35 people, whatever that's, you know, that you're really, that you feel like you're close to, but they may be a higher quantity of people, but not a higher quality of people. So sometimes having a smaller friend group, even though that it's a smaller number, um, has a higher quality in that sense. Yeah, I, I totally I totally agree with that. It's not about the numbers, it's about the presence, like the quality, like you mentioning. But I also like uh, what Rachel Naomi Remen has, um, she shared in the quote, she says, perhaps the secret of life, living well, is not having all the answer. We, we're saturated with so much information, but in pursuing unanswerable question in good company. I just like that. Yeah. It's very fluid. It's just, and a lot of times I, I think, um especially certain certain deep questions some of the longer longer handed questions that take time maybe we're struggling with something for years and years those things take time to flush out and we don't well, a lot of times we, we're like well you know i, I want a, a solutions that neat and nice and obviously we'd like that but sometimes we don't have the insight and sometimes it has to be broken down and i just like how she she mentions that kind of leading to the idea that you know some of these uh you know answering these questions with good company sometimes on that it's it, it, i think it's a very healthy kind of approach what are your thoughts when you see this quote yeah i love this quote i when i saw it when i saw your the show notes i was like man this is a good this is a good one it really as a therapist it really rang true for me because I feel like I'm caught in the expectation of producing an answer for people. And so that's mm -hmm. just something that, you know, sometimes uh, the answer is not necessarily what as a, as a collectively we try to get to, or like you said, it takes, it takes years to sometimes get to an answer or learn about why it's something's occurring for us. You know, when we encourage people to, to participate in therapy, it's because that there is a journey of them learning about themselves and bringing awareness to things and not even necessarily that they're going to make immediate, like all of a sudden tomorrow it's going to be different for them, but you know, what do you learn in that awareness? So, um, I really like that quote. It really you know, makes me realize that, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, we're working with folks that, you know, you don't have an answer for and that's okay. It's, you know, are you pursuing that good company to try to find, uh, you know, what that, because there's a lot of answers we just don't have as human beings. There's a lot of things that are beyond our, our ability to understand. Yeah. And, you know, I think about like when we're, uh, when we're children, when we're kids, we're discovering the world. There's a lot of curiosity. And like, like I, when I think of the, word curiosity i feel it just kind of denotes the idea of health if i'm curious about something then I'm, you know i'm intentionally you know why is this happening as i remember as children you, you have a group of children that you know at that age where they still don't feel i don't know self 
socially, I don't know, um, nervous. You'll be like, who's the best dancer? Everyone would raise their hand. <laughs> who's the best singer? Everyone would. Uh, something goes wrong, obviously. And uh, as we grow up, we, we start to be, we doubt happens. Obviously, you know, I'm not saying that's common, but at the same time, that level of curiosity, I think Albert Einstein says it best. He says, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. I, I feel a lot of times when it comes to connecting with others, uh, that approach can go a long way, especially if I'm not understanding a friend, a family member. I don't mean that I agree with someone. And that's okay. It's okay not to agree with people. Yep. So um, when you think about um, curiosity and its role when it comes to connecting, what comes to mind, uh, Patrick? Uh, you feel... Um, do you feel curiosity as being a healthy tool when we think about solving these kind of unanswerable questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, you know, we've lost the so, sort of the the attractiveness of curiosity <laughs> in that sense. We're trying to find answers. We're trying to understand. I think we live in a, in a very, uh, I think our period of time we live in right now is very answer oriented, right? There isn't a lot of curiosity because we've learned so so many things about so many different parts of our world, but yet we also don't know a lot about other parts of our world. So mm. there, curiosity is important. I think one of the other parts that goes with curiosity is to be vulnerable in that and be vulnerable about not knowing that we don't have all the answers. So there's certainly an aspect of, I like that, that, uh, that quote really spoke to me just in my own personal story, because I felt like there are periods in my life where you know, I didn't have a special talent, but uh, you know, I was able to, to connect with some, some levels of just kind of what what does it mean for me kind of moving forward and what how can I be used by God in that sense so that one that one spoke to me too yeah you know I wanted to uh, um, a lot of times you know it's 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 deeper it's more personal when we we personalize what's going on with us a lot of times me working with in the mental health field I always say personalize personal personalize your care you know it's, it's never unwise to look for a second opinion if you have something that you're not okay with but a lot of times we overgeneralize you know oh, i'm just sad because i'm sad you know, the, you know that kind of thing yeah. but it, i find it more effective especially in mental health or a more ambiguous kind of uh, when we're not really quite sure you know understanding like maybe taking time to write down why these stuff bother the reflection portion of your of your journey per se but Pausing there, I just want to give in a lot of times I'd like to give new guests, um, returning guests, an opportunity to share their story. What brought them here? You know, like what brought them here today? And just like anything you would like to share with the audience. Now's your time, Patrick. Sure. Yeah. So I so I'm a I'm a professional licensed professional counselor. I've been a therapist since 2016. So I'm uh, this is my going into my eighth year of being a therapist. Um, I've been a general practitioner uh, for most of that time. You know, as far as uh, as far as you know, I didn't really have a specialty area that I worked in until about 2020. Then I started working specifically with sexual addiction, and that's kind of the area I've landed in right now. So this is my going to my fourth year of doing that. Um, it's kind of working with people who struggle. Uh, you know any kind of compulsive sexual behavior, but certainly uh, around, around the area of porn and, and uh, you know, compulsive relationships tend to be kind of the two big areas we, we sort of see. Um, you know, throughout all my life, I mean, I've been, uh, you know, mental health has been something that's been important. I was uh, growing up, I, I was, I experienced a period of my life where I was diagnosed with Asperger's. So it was like when I was about junior high. And uh, so I was had an early experience kind of getting a chance to see the mental health field sort of as a patient or as a client. Mm -hmm. um, as I got older, I, you know, I, I never really had a specific talent kind of speaking to that quote that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't really have an area where that, like, that I had the, this is where I really feel it led to, or God's you know, opened this door for me to go to. And, uh, and I remember when I was about 18 years old, I had this experience of, uh, seeing this video of people coming out with these big, like, you know, almost like giant index cards of, and they mm -hmm. had an identity written on them. And then they flipped this identity and how their identity was changed. And so I, and that was my kind of moment where I felt God called me. I want you part of me being part of that. I want this to be part of your life. I want to see, I want to see people be changed. So um, that's what kind of drew me into being a therapist. And so I, so I spent the last, uh, from about the time I was 18 till about the time I was about 26, uh, mm -hmm. working to get to that point. And then when I was, uh, when I was 26, I started uh, in the field and, um, and I've had a lot of different, you know, it, it's been a lot of different adventures for me through that is, you know, is where God's taken me and uh, some different places I've been part of. And so it's been, I've really enjoyed that, uh, that journey. I've learned a lot. Um, and then being able to be a specialist, I've learned a ton with that as well. So and I started this, 
podcast journey and started kind of being a guest in podcasts. It was something mm-hmm. I've, I've been interested in for a long time and I started doing that last year. So, um, yeah, but a lot of different things that kind of led me to this point, but, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a good journey so far. Yeah. I always love to hear why people do what they do. And for me, I just remember, um, just to share a little bit, um, getting out of the military, I, I was, I was struggling with some mental health issues. And I remember going to support group and I'm saying, this is awful. I was so upset. I was so bitter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, I was in the air force. I'm like, you know, you guys had all this time. I'm, I'm serving. And I just felt like I couldn't connect. You know, or this month is our connections. What I found out like years later, which is kind of funny because I, I even though the bitterness made sense, Patrick, it wasn't right. Even though I was right, I was wrong because I found out coming back to it. Um, I found a passion that I, uh, I love. I love working with people in the mental health field. I like working directly. And um, it's just been a, a kind of turnaround moment because there's one place where you're like, no, these people don't understand. These are the, and then you realize that's where you need to be. And it's mm-hmm. kind of that kind of turnaround when you realize that sometimes that resistance kind of sh- shares a lot of where you're at at the time. And I do appreciate you sharing a little bit about your story. And um, I want to ask you, you know, it's interesting a lot of times when people think about sexual addiction, you know, when they think about, you know, especially this time in year, you know, there's a lot of pressures with <laughs> Hallmark makes a lot of money <laughs> during the greeting cards season when it comes to Valentine's Day. There's a lot of pressures of I don't want to be alone. Loneliness can be a very, I would say, especially working in the field, um, can be devastating if someone's feeling that a severe level of loneliness what 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 have you seen help people who are struggling to connect and especially in your field and your specialty what what would what advice would you tell people who feel that this i don't know there's a pressure to connect you know, like it, pressure to i guess couple or like have a relationship quickly what would you share what would you like to share with those people well, I guess there's a couple of things I'd say. The the first thing I'd say is that we are relational beings. And so we are, you're designed to be connected with people. We are, that's important for us to have. But, you know, again, like we were kind of mentioning earlier, you know, we want to slow down. We want mm-hmm. to have those connections be genuine. We want those connections to be, um, to be uh, not only it's like genuine, but also to be, uh, to be really really well we want those i'm trying to find the right word for it but we we, we want those connections to be uh to be very uh, solid connections with people we don't yeah. want those to be you know kind of people just on the outside and uh not really being close to us so i really think that comes down to vulnerability and i think mm-hmm. there's an aspect to people especially when you see like with what i work with there's a lot of people who struggle with vulnerability and just being you know not only knowing who they are accepting somewhat of who they are and then being able to you know demonstrate and show that um, and I, you, you go back to Brene Brown, and I think about vulnerability, mm-hmm. vulnerability with her. I mean, she made a whole career out of talking about vulnerability and shame with people. And you think about, uh, you know, I use the example of, you know, we have these fences up in our lives. And I use the old show, Home Improvement, uh, Tim mm-hmm. Allen show, as the example. The neighbor had that, you know, had that high fence up and everybody only saw his eyes. Mm-hmm. And that's an example of somebody who didn't really want to be vulnerable. Um, and mm-hmm. there's a comedic effect to that. But from a perspective of that being in mental health, I mean, we have, the, everybody's got those fences up, right? And so there's, you know, how much of the, how high are we want those fences to go is how willing we're, how much we're willing to be sharing about who, what's really going on in our yard. And mm-hmm. if we want to bring that fence down, some people just have a property line, you know, they have a complete openness to that, that those are people who are very solid in who they are. They know that they, they can be open, they can be vulnerable, they can, they can be transparent. Some people really struggle with that aspect of doing that. So vulnerability is a choice. It's a difficult choice to risk yourself. Um, it's also because there's a possibility of rejection. So, but I think in order to be accepted by our people, we have to take that risk. Otherwise, we're going to be uh, always having that fence up in that way. So I think that uh, those are things that uh, some things I could think about uh, as far as connecting with people. Yeah, you know, I always find it um, especially um, a challenge because a lot of every person's context is different. Um, a lot of times I'm working in the field and a person's coming out of state hospital. They've been there for 10 plus years and the idea of connection is overwhelming, you know, but you know, a lot of times you, I, I think just like you're saying, um, little by little, like I cannot compare or have, have the same measurement, but a lot of times when we, we address things as they come, as opposed to, uh, 
a lot of times i uh, like you mentioned the vulnerability is a big thing uh and when i could get to the point where uh the person just um is able to um you know self-reflect and then work on that with me obviously with therapy and decide the idea of um that this will take time you know mm-hmm. and, and, and 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 then uh knowing your protective factors knowing what's there uh building off that and also just finding coping skills that may be helpful to kind of reflect on a lot of times there's the was it the uh cognitive distortions that we can, can build up or negative irrational thoughts that can kind of be its own barriers at times um um when it comes to this connect this connectedness and i do find that sometimes the level of urgency doesn't match you know um you don't have any friends yet you want to have a relationship right away um society says i need to have a relationship to be valuable which really is it doesn't sound like the individual itself it just feels like outside outside pressures what has what have you um and just to ask um what have you seen to be i guess affect uh, a way to kind of help with those um uh i guess unrealistic uh, expectations per se slowing things down what 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 has helped uh, i guess yourself or people you work with to slow it down to say hey yeah hey it's okay that i'm not there yet um the shadows kind of let that on the side what what have you found to be helpful when it, when you're working with someone in that manner yeah, and, I, and I'll, I want to address that for sure, but just to add something you had said, um, and I think it's a very good point, right? You got to practice vulnerability. That's something that people, I think, miss a lot of the time, right? You were kind of making that point, like, you know, do we connect with people? Do we continue to practice that? It's not just a one time thing and it's done. And that's within even relationships that we're close to, you know, where you still have to continue to practice that. You know, you never are going to, you know, you can never, like, once you're close to a person, you can never just stay in that same place. You get, it kind of it goes like this. It's in and out. And you have to turn back into the relationship. So, <clears throat> but as far as, uh, you know, what is it found or what have I found to be helpful as far as kind of, you know, making, you know, that working on that pressure in that way is that, you know, I think the big thing is that, you know, the long, I've had advice given to me in the past about, you know, waiting as long as you can to find, you know, to, till you get decided to get married or decided to get in a relationship, mainly because, there's things you're going to discover about yourself as you get older that you will not discover about yourself when you're younger. So the main reason is that because you're, you're going to learn more about you. So part of it is that even if you're in a relationship, you're going to learn more about yourself. And sometimes when you're in a relationship, those things you learn about yourself come out because you're in the relationship with that person. <laughs> and that makes it really challenging in that way. So sometimes you see, you'll see things about yourself later that you never really saw because you're in a relationship. So one is, do you know yourself well? Do you know yourself going into a relationship? Do you, so part of that slowing down is you being able to slow yourself because you, you understand you more. I think the other thing that comes up too is that uh, knowing that comparison is, is, is you know, again, sort of the, the, the robber, I think the robber of all joy basically is that, mm-hmm. you know, when we start comparing ourselves to our people, we're going to, we're going to miss our own path to whoever mm-hmm. the person is we're going to meet. And sometimes those people that we meet uh, that we, that we can be married to or the people we can find to be in a relationship with are actually the people we thought we were going to reject before, mainly mm-hmm. because we have this idea of what they call the cosmic love or cosmic relationship, mm-hmm. which is this kind of perfect person that doesn't exist out there. And what I see a lot of times, especially when we're talking about sex addiction is, is the perpetuation of pornography actually adds to that. So people think that they're going to meet a porn star. People mm-hmm. think that they're going to find this person. That's going to be this, you know, everything that they've been watching in this fantasy and that fantasy isn't real. And so mm-hmm. one of the real opening eyes, you know, my, my experience has been that when you understand fantasy is not real, it's not reality. You're going to start looking mm-hmm. for reality, but you have to be in that reality all the time. You can't, you can't allow fantasy to hijack you again because sometimes it will. And so that's something that, you know, as part of being slowed down is not, you know, don't not be in fantasy. Yeah, and uh, I I do like that. It's it's this intentional. It's not this a uh, one. Uh, oh, I gained some insight. Now I know. It's something that you kind of have to keep nurturing. Um, what uh, now? You kind of mentioned it, but what if there's any other habits that you've seen helpful to maintain a, uh, a healthy, well-rounded connection? What what would what would that be? What would you want to share with those listening? Yeah, so maintain connectedness. Uh, you know, really finding a group of people that share a lot of the same passions that you have, whether it be, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be religious, you know, theologically, whether it be from a perspective of, you know, hobbies you enjoy doing, whether it be, 
you know, again, things that you enjoy from the perspective of how, um, things that you're interested in. You know, if you will enjoy what, you know, if you enjoy photography, find people that enjoy, that enjoy photography. If you enjoy, um, you know, for example, learn how to fly. If you like to be a pilot, learn to hang out with other people who want to be pilots. You know, do some things that like that. If you love cycling, do go, you know, hang out with people who like to cycle, you know, stuff like that. I think common activities start to build that bond. They build a sense of belonging. You kind of touched a little bit on that earlier, Robert. Um, devote regular scheduled time, you know, especially with couples, we see this, you know, devoting a regular date night. And that works also with other relationships, you know, devote a time. Hey, we're going to go out and have dinner on Friday nights. A uh, group of us, four guys, five guys, you know, whoever it might be, um, you know, men or women both together, you know, make that, make that something you're, you know, combined and working toward that time together. Um, I think the other thing as well is, you know, um, being able to do some type of, uh, you know, again, that's not a physical activity, like a high level physical activity, like the, you know, like maybe like rock climbing or doing some kind of major sport or something, but doing those times where you can come together and connect, um, you know, being able to share those relationships, whether they be vulnerable or whether, you know, again, even if it's just a, you know, again, to have that sense of belonging, those things can be a big part of that. I, you know, I, I do, you know, thinking about just, you know, when I'm working with someone just trying to find those, um, build those social supportive resources, you know, the idea of, whatever that looks like, you know, it could be a chess club. It could be something, whatever your interest. And I also want to mention like friendships change, Absolutely. you know, like, like when you're, you might have, I have friendships from college, from high school. And I, you know, I don't really connect as well as I did back then, yeah. but I wish them the best. It's just life. You know, sometimes we're a little bit hard on that. Oh, I don't, I don't call them back or I don't connect to them. I, I think we, at least from my perspective, we need to be a little bit kinder and understand that you know, friendships do cycle in different change. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad friend just because I'm not able to connect the same way. We might be on the other side of the United States or wherever it is, but at the same time, I think if we treat it lightly and just you know, um, you know, know that at least friendships, our relationships do change in time doesn't necessarily mean that we're bad at connecting if that makes sense yeah and, and seasons absolutely <laughs> there's seasons of life there's seasons of relationships you know different seasons happen they come and go like you said the connections are going to be different um you know where i'm at is and again you're you're changing in that same process right it's not yeah. just them that's changing there you're changing too so there's an element of that you know the connectedness and what it means to be connected is going to look different for you you know maybe 10 years from now as it did you know 10 years ago you know so i think part of that is are we willing to be able to be open to the idea that connectedness is going to change? It's not going to be the same as it was or what we understood it when we were younger. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, what has been any, um, any lessons you learned or are learning when it comes to connecting with those around us that you would like to share? Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is that, you know, we're staying connected because relationships, as we kind of were talking about, are never one and done. You know, no matter what, what we're going to have in it, you know, every relationship, whether it be with the guy, with our parents or siblings or spouses or friends or coworkers, or it might be, you know, all these things are, you know, we can't just connect and sit, you know, we can't just say, okay, Hey, this is going to happen. And now we're going to move forward. You know, we got to remember that relationships are kind of like a living organism. And so we got to maintain them as such. You know, we have to keep turning back into them and what, uh, and, you know, in order for them to can stay connected and be solid. Um, it's a rigorous pursuit between two people, you know, that I do have a role in the relationship, but also the air person with me, you know, whether it be an intimate relationship or in friendship or whatever, has a role to also maintain that as well. And we have to have that kind of two-way street there. It's a two-way nurturing opportunity. And so these levels of intimacy, of course, really depend on, you know, sort of the, the real type of relationship it is. But if you want to have those genuine connections, it has to be two, le has to be two levels of, um, or two-way street of nurturing in that sense. Yeah, you know, I, I just, you know, as you know, I'm a leader in church, just the uh, one model that I always find very helpful is how I see God really is how I treat others and myself. So it, it is a vengeful kind of fire brimstone God I'm going to treat that way to those around me. Um, and funny enough, a lot of times we just look at that, but there's also the distant God that we mm -hmm. think about just in the in the idea of, how we relate to people around us. So God, for me, I'm okay with a distant God. That means a lot of my relationships will be distant. Yes. A lot of times will be, and I'll feel most comfortable. So these kind of insights, especially when I'm working with people, not only in my profession, but also in, at church and the church setting, 
it's good to kind of remember because I think um, we can learn a lot about how we see, especially when it comes to faith-based, how we see God. Because when we're kids, at least from my perspective, um, the closest thing to God is our parents. So a lot of times we kind of mirror how that is. So it's, it's, I don't know, sometimes I find that as a useful tool for reflection on where I'm at when it comes to, you know, my, my own self-reflection. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Um, l- l- let me ask you, um, and this is kind of an open-ended question leading to some final thoughts, but why do you think it's important? Obviously, we've been saying it a million different ways, but, you know, why do you think it's important to set aside time to improve our connections? Uh, a lot of people could just say, you know, that all sounds great, but I got X, Y, Z things to do and all this stuff. There's only 24 hours in a day. Um, I'm busy. What, what would you, uh, especially, uh, no, I'll, I'll answer the same question after you do. What, why do you think it's important for those listening to consider being a little more intentional in our connections and try to set aside time to improving them? Yep, definitely. And for people out there listening, I guess they might ask, how does how does isolation help or uh, help us or help you in that way? Mm-hmm. You know, I recently saw a video with one of the recovery groups I, I, I have, I'm part of, um, you know, how loneliness affects the human body. And these are some more recent statistics. Heart disease increases by 29%. Stroke increases by 32%. We have more stress, more important paranoia, more suspicion when we're lonely. It drives retreat. Uh, our dopamine levels in our mind end up actually becoming, uh, they actually increase, which are more susceptible to quick fixes. So like pornography, gambling, alcohol, those kind of things are more susceptible when we're lonely. Natural pain relief that, that God puts in our body for chronic pain to help us manage the things of our body end up decreasing and our sleep quality, quality decreases. And those are just a few of the things, but when we're spiritually alone, kind of talked about that at the beginning, and you know, we're more susceptible to being overcome by those sinful desires. So there's a lot of different things that, that function as part of that, that, that loneliness plays a role into it. And I'd kind of equate back to the lack of connection really will lead to loneliness, which will lead to some of these other things that we just were talking about. Yeah, I also just want to piggyback on the idea is when we are feeling that level of loneliness, we don't have the ability a lot of times to be mindful and the mm-hmm. idea of distancing ourselves to kind of see what is going on. You know, working in the field, a lot of times, sometimes I'm in courtrooms, and a lot of times those uh, situations are, you know, it's not that the situation, I, I can understand the person being frustrated. There's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing right. wrong with that. It's how we react to it. And yeah, if we don't give ourselves any time to kind of reflect, hey, you know, I'm angry here. But, you know, just because I'm angry doesn't um, necessarily mean that I need to react it this way. And a lot of times that pause is can le- can be a big difference between being in the le- legal system and not. That's it, like, and, and that's something, at least I want to encourage those who are, and they're like, well, what, what does that have to do with connection? Well, when you set aside time for yourself and the idea that I want to improve my connections, you also improve your self-reflection on yourself so that that's uh, what i would like to say any final thoughts you want to share patrick it was wonderful to have you on so i really appreciate it i'd like to i really appreciate our conversation some of the thoughts you had as well um i do think you know just encourage people to to continue to be courageous in their choices and courageous in how they are moving forward and that um you know, don't let that don't let fear to don't let fear of things fear of themselves or fear of our people uh you know shackle them from being you know having the, the connections that they could uh, you know have with our relationships in their life and i think that that's you know fear is something that uh does tend to overwhelm people and um you know just you know again like stepping into that courage it takes courage to do that but you know i was like there's a there's a quote that i always get wrong but basically is that the one thing of uh, one thing that the person who's brave and the person who's a coward has in common is that they both are afraid uh mm-hmm. just one tends to you know one one chooses to both move forward despite the fear and so um i always think of that quote when we're talking about being courageous yeah, and I just want to share also, um, uh, little self-care is better than no self-care. So just start from somewhere, you know, a lot of this stuff may be overwhelming, but, you know, choosing yourself, um, self-care, uh, I, I'm just kind of ruining a paraphrase of a quote is, you know, when we self-care, we give our best self out there. When we don't, we give what's left. So I, I did want to encourage those who are listening you know, be kinder to yourself. This stuff will take time. Um, we're not saying there's, there's no quick fixes, but, you know, the thing is, that's what makes life kind of interesting. 
be a little bit curious. I want to say thank you so much, Patrick, for coming on and sharing your insight. Um, I want to share those listening. Remember to stay updated with Revive Ministries through the various platforms. ReviveMinistriesFL.com is our website. This is goodbye from Revive Ministries Podcast, leaving with the last book from Coretta Scott King. The greatness of a community is mostly accurate, most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members.